You'll take your Bibles uh, and turn with me first. We're going to turn to to John 14 real quick here. John 14. Let's just read real quick, just verse 12 and uh, to 14 real quick. These are verses I'm sure that are well known to you. In John 14, beginning with verse 12, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who, what? Believes in, not in yourself, in him. He who believes in me, the works that I do, what will he do? He will do them also, and greater works than these he will do. Because I go to my... Okay, that's very particular. He's talking about returning to the Father so that he could pour out the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's what he's telling. He says, I, I, has to, I have to return to the Father. If I don't, then the Holy Spirit won't come. He's the promise of the Father. Jesus needed to be glorified and at the right hand of the Father. And then he poured out again what happened on the day of Pentecost. You know these things. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So just out of curiosity, do you believe then that Jesus, by working in you by the Holy Spirit, can help you make you do His works. Oh, that was really weak. Do you believe that He can use you to do His works? Yes. Okay, very good. Do you believe that He can enable that you can do greater? Okay, now we're just going off His Word. That's all we're doing, okay? Do you believe then that when He says that you can pray and that whatever you ask, to ask in My name, I will do? Do you believe that? You've got a problem if you believe that men's wills are free. Because some of you don't believe that God's sovereign enough to deal with people when He says He's going to deal with people. That somehow men's wills are more powerful than the working of God. Why pray for someone to get saved if you believe it's all their choice? <laughs> Sorry. In my spirit, I've been wrestling because I, I, I don't want to address this. This isn't what I want to touch on tonight. But in my spirit, I keep getting exercised. See, we pray, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah? That's what Jesus said, pray. If you believe that man's will is sovereign above the purpose of God, then why pray that? Because God, according to your thought process, God can't answer that. Because man's power is stronger than God's power. I don't believe that. I believe that God's a sovereign God. And if God says He's going to work, He's going to work. If He sends forth His Word, nothing can stop Him. Not the will of man, not the enemy. And if the will of man is under the power of the evil one, what happens then? Then who's really in charge? <laughs> I'm sorry, is this, is this too, too quick? See, when you, we, we talked about this all afternoon, and so I'm, I'm not really wanting to readdress this tonight. See, when, when you came to faith, you didn't come to faith because you had this idea that I needed Jesus. It initiated with God working in your heart to bring you to a place where you would confess Christ because your natural affection was darkness. Jesus said that the natural affection of man, this is the condemnation, John uh, chapter 3 and verse 19, and this is the condemnation, that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They refuse to come to the light lest their deeds, that they hate the light, they refuse to come to light lest their deeds should be exposed. There it is, sorry. So if men's affections naturally are to love what? And to hate Okay, now go to 1 John uh, 1, verse 5. This is probably the simplest way, and then we'll get on to what we really wanted to look at tonight. What does the Bible say God is? Light and... So man's affections naturally are to love everything that God isn't and to hate everything that God is. If that's true, then you're stuck unless God works in your situation, unless the Holy Spirit comes 
to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. This is the good news of the Gospel. That through the simplicity of the message preached, God will save those who believe. Your natural ability will not save you. Only Jesus saves. So when that conviction begins to happen, hope begins to say, well, Jesus, I can't save myself. Then Jesus, you have to save me. Jesus, you have to change my heart so I'll love you. Say, people say that say, God won't command us to do something that we can't do on our own power. Have you ever heard that? That God won't command someone to do something they can't do. You know something? That's not true. God does it all the time. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with? Can you do that without His help? Oh. So I guess He did command you to do something you couldn't do naturally. Could Adam have done it? Yeah. But he didn't. So our hearts have to have a change. There has to be a shift. And I'm telling you, salvation is of the Lord. It's not of man. It's not our ability. It's His. Please hear me. I don't know why I'm being exercised in my spirit so much. There's another thing that's being exercised. Some of you have been made, made decisions where you knew you were being disobedient, and now afterwards you've changed your heart, but you won't acknowledge what you've done, and you want God to bless even while you remain in your position. That's covering your sin. Please don't do that. When God shows you that you were off and you confess it to Him, that's when you uncover it. That's when mercy becomes available. See, some of us want to, well, I'll do what I want to do, and then it, it doesn't work out the way we are hoping that it'll work out. We think that the compromise will make it work. So we've compromised, and we've done this thing, and now it's a mess. And, and we know it's a mess, but we try to pretend that we didn't know, we didn't see. But God judges the heart, not the outward, out, outward appearance of things. So our responsibility, God won't fix the situation until you repent. Because you'll go around thinking that you got away with it. You'll go around thinking that, well, God still blessed it anyway, no matter what I did. That's false. That's a false idea. So what happens is, is that you've got to acknowledge to him. You've got to be open about it. Lord, I was wrong. I chose and I was disobedient to your command. Then... He's free to deal with it because you've now repented. You've not tried to cover your sin. You've exposed it. And if we confess our sin, He's what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So don't try to pretend. Don't try to hide that you didn't know. You did know. Those are the two things. Anyway, let's go on. Let's go to Mark. Actually, we want to, from, from John. So, so you believe that, that you can do Jesus' works. The Holy Spirit will help you do Jesus' works and greater, yeah? Okay. Have you ever looked at a day in the life of Jesus? Have you? All right. Well, well if you have, great. So we're going to do it anyway. So let's go to Mark chapter, let's see. Um... How about, let's go with um, Mark chapter 1. We'll just look at a day in the life of Jesus. Because this is what he does. So if you're going to do his works, then here you go. Here's a list. Is, is that okay? Is this too simple? Then he went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught... And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with a what? An unclean spirit. <laughs> and he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come here to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. 
But Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet or be muzzled and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And he immediately, his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. That was Jesus' morning. It was eventful. He's preaching, which is understandable. Jesus would teach and he would be there. And then all of a sudden, right in the middle of the service, someone starts manifesting a demon. Now, it says that this was in their synagogue. It's just interesting their wording. And so this guy starts manifesting and he starts saying, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, Jesus didn't let him speak. He muzzled him very quickly. There's a reason for that. Because demonic revelation is not to reveal to somebody who Jesus is. (laughs) Demonic revelation isn't to reveal to an individual who Jesus is. Do you remember when Jesus spoke to Peter? And he said, Who do men say that I am? He's talking to his disciples. He's in Caesarea Philippi at the time. And he says, who who do men say that I am? And they say, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, so forth. And then he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter responds with, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. That's what he says. Jesus turns to him and says, Peter, uh, Simon Barjona, I'll keep it specific. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed that to you. But my Father who is in divine revelation is different than demonic revelation. Divine revelation is different than demonic revelation. I remember meeting this guy. It was shortly after Bible school. I went back to the States and we had one of those house group things. And this one guy in the, in the group said that um, I, we were talking about how did you become a Christian? And he, and he said, well, he said, I began to believe in God because I saw a warlock turn into a rat and run away. That's what he said. I said, what? He said, I saw a warlock turn into a rat and he ran away. So I knew the devil was real. So I knew God was real. So I'm Christian now. No. 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 He never came to a revelation of who Jesus is. So you can know the devil's real. You can even know God's real. Demons know that. In fact, that demon speaking to Jesus in the midst of says, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. That demon, I guarantee you, it doesn't have eternal life. See, that revelation has to come from heaven. There are people who get revelations from all sorts of places. Doctrines of demons. There are people who read a book and then they just quote the book but they've never had an encounter with Jesus himself. The Holy Spirit's never kind of... because How do you know? Because you change. Because when the Holy Spirit does something, he reveals who Christ is. All of a sudden, your faith shifts, and it's, it's in him, and you know him. And that's how you have eternal life, in knowing him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they... Follow me. That demon wasn't following Jesus, that's for sure. This is his morning. So he muzzles it. You'll find that it repeats it in the sections. He repeats it again, that he muzzles them. He stops them from speaking. Because the revelation of who he is is only to come from the the Father. You can't even pick it up from someone else. See, sometimes we think that we we can become Christian by osmosis. I mean, if, if I just, if I just, if I just hang out with Paul enough and I'm close enough to Paul, I can get his faith on me. That's silly. You've got to go directly to him. Jesus is the only one that can make you a Christian. No priest, no prophet. You can't even do it. You can't make yourself Christian. Who makes you Christian? Jesus does, alone. I'm telling you, there are people who who 
find conviction, but it's only worldly sorrow and it leads to death. But godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. It's His work in you. It's His work in you. Jesus is mourning. Uh, he's in church. Where is he? Uh, he's gathering with the people of God, isn't he? I, I'm gonna. I want to be gentle, but I'm gonna. I'm gonna tap this hammer for a second. Some of y'all just come on a Sunday night because you can't be bothered getting up early enough in the morning. You want to do the works of Jesus? You can't even get out of bed. Sorry. This is the life of Jesus. We want to walk it. We want to live it. I do. You do. Yeah? Well, that was quiet. I said, you do, right? Yeah, I'd love to live the life of Jesus as long as I don't have to change anything. Repentance means something has to change. It's really quiet tonight. I'm not sure what's going on here. So what, what happens after Jesus leaves? Verse 29. Now as soon as they came out of, had come out of the... Alright, so they're there for the morning. They enter the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother... This is Peter... His, wait a second, how does it, what is it? Simon's wife's mother. Simon's what? So Peter was married? Well, that's an odd one. Someone told me once that if you were a pope, you couldn't be married. If Peter had a wife, then why do they forbid others for having wives? Well, it's just in the Bible. I believe the book, not tradition. So Peter's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. And Jesus said, sorry, I already preached this morning. I'm too tired. You need to give me some space so I can recharge. Is that what he said? You know how many preachers I see saying stuff like that. It's nonsense. See, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ what? In you. Tell me when he leaves. Ever. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. See, I'm going to start touching, and there's three words I'm going to give to you here. One is, one is called service. The other one's called sacrifice. And the other one's called suffering. And you'll watch the life of Jesus. He does all three. He serves with intention. If you look in that text, how many times it says immediately? Immediately. This is what he did. Immediately, that's what he did. It was of absolute intention. He chose to serve. Some of you say, well, I won't serve unless someone has to ask me. Really? Why is that? You've been born again? It's the Spirit of God filling you? Then what should you do? You choose to serve. You choose, you look for situations. If there's a hole in the wall, don't tell someone else there's a hole in the wall. Fix it. Put something in it. Take care of business. Jesus chose to serve. Simon's wife's love mother lay sick with a fever. They told him about her at, at once. And he came and took her by the hand and what? Lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her. Then what'd she do? Said, oh, I need to go back to bed for a while. What did she do? She served. That's interesting. There's a lot of that going on, isn't it? This is just one day in the life of Jesus, mind you. Someone gets delivered in the morning, preaches his sermon, and shares the gospel with people, and then goes home for lunch over to, over to, over to Simon's and... And Andrew's house, they were brothers, by the way, and then James and John, and they went over to her, his house, and, 
and, and, and the mother-in-law is sick, so Jesus just helps her, heals her, and then, uh, and then uh, she gets up and serves them. You know, what it means is they probably had food after that. They probably ate together. So they spend the morning together. And now they're spending what? The afternoon together. And then it says Jesus went home after that. Is that what it says? What do you think? Look at this. Verse 32. At what? This is just a day in the life of Jesus. At evening when the sun had set. That's when it really got busy. Jesus didn't turn the sign over. It says, sorry, um, we're closed now. Did he? See, everyone's really... You probably see what I'm doing here. You're saying, I want to do the works of Jesus, but I don't want to give myself to anything. I'd love to see the miraculous take place, but you won't lay your hands on anyone. You can't. We've got a social distance. Sorry, I'm just being honest here. I'd love, you know, it'd be great. You know, I, I just, I'm going to comment on this. You know, right now, right this very moment, if you went down Newport Road where Curry's is, Every single Sunday night, there's hundreds of young people out there. Hundreds. You know what I'd love to see happen? I'd love to see you all with an attitude that says, you know, I'm willing to serve. I want to see Jesus work through me. Listen, I'll shut the doors and we'll all go down there. I'm not kidding. You see, it went real quiet then. See, some of you, you know you've been called. But I'm telling you, you have to give yourself to the work of the Lord. You can't, it's not just going to fall in your lap in that way. You step out in faith. You step out in faith. This is what happens. You step out in the power of the Spirit of God and you'll, be, you'll do His works. But what often happens is we draw lines and we say, yep, uh, Jesus, I'll serve you. I'm willing to give myself on Saturdays between one and three. Is that a sacrificial life, you think? Jesus, I'm willing to give myself two hours on a Sunday. What is that? The Bible says that in Romans 12 that we offer ourselves to Him as what? Living sacrifices. Because God will always do this with you. I guarantee it. He'll, that line that you've got drawn that says, no, I've got, I've got to do it this way and you know you have to have all your ducks in a row and, and, and Jesus, he'll, he'll look at you as you're standing on the other side of that line that you drew and he says, you want to come with me a bit further? Hey, I, I won't ask you to go any further than I've gone. You want to come with me? See, sacrifice goes beyond where you've chosen to serve. Sacrifice is when it really begins to cost you. Sacrifice is when it puts you out. But sacrifice is a good thing in the kingdom because the Lord rewards it, pressed down and overflowing. That evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. Verse 33, what does it say? <laughs> My goodness. The whole city. I don't know how many people lived at Capernaum. I wonder if it was bigger than Len Rumney. There's about 11,000 people who live in Len Rumney. Could you imagine if someone's saying, if someone's saying 2,000, I don't know who said that. It's so about a couple of thousand, 2,000 people. I'll have to check that, but I'll take your free word. So 2,000 people come for prayer. How fast can you pray for them? How long do you think that took? Sun's gone down now. Two, three o'clock in the morning? What do you think? Yeah. 
You know what I don't see here? I don't see Jesus complaining about anything. I don't see it at all. I don't hear him saying, well, I, I didn't count on this. I didn't plan for this. Well, I didn't expect it to go this way. I, I don't see any of that, do you? I, I see what he did. It says, and then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And again, he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. That's just a day in the life of Jesus. How do you spend your day? Let's just give Sunday for, for instance. How do you spend that day? I, I'm here all day. I, I want to be, by the way. It's not a burden. We come in the morning. We preach three services. Every service, every message is different. Every single one of them. We have lunch together. We get to fellowship together. <laughs> the sun's still up now. Some of you come. I, I'm just going to say this: is that some of you are here all day. It's an amazing thing. I really, it, I, I still get shocked by it. You come in the morning, and all day you're here. When the early church met, when did they meet? Every day. You ever wonder how they grew so quickly? You ever wonder how maturity developed so quickly? You ever wonder how they reached so many people in such a short time? They met when? Every day. As a pastor, I've watched this. Those that have been, and I'm just telling you as I see it, I've watched people as they've come in the morning, they've stayed all day. And they're, you know, when everyone else is gone, they're usually the ones that are helping to clean up in here as after everyone's left. I have seen such a transformation in them over these last months. It's been amazing. I've been in shock by it. I didn't realize it would have make so much of a difference. They're under the word three times on a Sunday. They share fellowship all day long. And I watch the change taking place in them, watching something shift in them. It's amazing, really. I'm just telling you what I see. A day in the life of Jesus. How many still want to do His works? We like the impossible, but we don't do what we can. We want to see the extraordinary take place but we won't give ourselves to where we can. The things that are under your control, then we give to Him. We seek first the of God and His righteousness. And all these things are added as well. In the morning, in the lunch, in the evening, Say, well, Jesus, how could you continue that way? That's a long schedule, isn't it? That is a long schedule. If you've ever been on mission, I mean, think of Paul just got back. They, Paul and Julie were on mission over the weekend. And, uh, and when you're doing mission, it's very tiring, isn't it? It is. So how do you keep that up? What do you think? How do you keep up that kind of momentum? Let me, let me take you to an Old Testament passage and we'll go back to this one here. Look at Isaiah 40, for instance. And we'll pick up the reading from verse 27 of Isaiah 40. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my just claim Passed over by my God. Have you, have, not, have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither what? Or is? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the? 
And those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But those who what? What will they do? They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be. And they shall walk and not. You think that's real? You think that's just one of those promises that's just, it's a nice thing to quote or put on a birthday card? Or do you think really if you took time and waited on the Lord? Really, you're tired though. I'm tired. If you really, you, you took maybe your Bible out and you went away where, into your bedroom maybe and you just opened it up and spent time. So you got on your knees and if you can and you just spent time reading and Worshiping and waiting on him? Do you think he'd share his strength with you? In fact, in the text, the idea is that he exchanges strength. That he takes yours and he gives you new strength. I, I remember when the Lord was um, really teaching this one to me. I was working two jobs at the time. I was working nights and I was working days. I drove a forklift all night long and then during the days I worked as a runner for the UPS truck. I was a bit younger and a bit thinner at the time. And I remember it was during this Christmas season and I was really looking to wait on the Lord and, and it was during this time I would get home from work in the night and I would come and I'd get uh, I, or in the early morning and I'd come in my room and I'd put my Bible out and I would, I would wait on the Lord, I'd worship and I would spend time in His Word. Then I would leave after a little while and go to my second job. And it was during this season, God says, um, no coffee either. He says, those who wait on me renew their strength, not those who drink enough caffeine. I did that for two seasons. I was grateful when the Lord spoke to me the one day as I was reaching up and I remember I was going to get on the, get on the truck and he said, Wade, he said, money and righteousness are a lot alike. No matter how much you earn, you'll never quite have enough. But if you trust me, you'll have all that you need. So I didn't do that season again. <laughs> because I found that he would supply. But he taught me about waiting on him. Renewing strength physically. You guys want to see revival happen, yeah? Think about it. All day into the night. Work. All day into the night. Work. All day. Really. Those who wait on the... Can I just ask you, do you, do you wait on the Lord? See, some of you have a, a tremendous capacity for busyness. And if you're an evangelist, you're, 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 you're gifted with an uncanny ability to keep busy. It's amazing. But busyness isn't the same thing as receiving strength from the Lord. Spiritual strength is not the same thing as fleshly fervor. To where you actually wait on Him and spend time with Him. Let's go back to Mark. So what does Jesus do? He does exactly what He tells us to do. It says in verse 35 of Mark 1, he says, Now in the morning, having risen a what? Before daylight. He went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. And that was personal time. There, there was no teaching in it. He wasn't trying to impress the, the apostles. He he was practically trying to get away so that he could spend solitary time with the Father. Tell me, if Jesus sought to, to 
to, in the midst of a busy schedule, if he sought to get away and spend solitary time with the Father, what do you think we ought to do? See, Jesus taught in, in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, listen, he says, go to your Father in secret. Call out to him in secret because then he'll reward you what? Openly. This is exactly what Jesus operates in. I've had some of you come and say, Pastor, I'm just so busy, I can't spend time with the Lord. You're in danger. Because there'll, there'll be a moment like a, a dried up stick where you'll just break. And there won't be any life there. It'll be like a hollow tube. Please don't. Please don't. The Lord has provided for you and for me to be able to, to be filled. To wait on Him. Do you know, those of you who like Old Testament stuff, do you know when the priest was working in the temple, underneath he had a, a linen ephod that he wore underneath his clothes? It was so he didn't sweat. Because activity in the temple wasn't supposed to be exertion like that. You weren't supposed to sweat. Some of you are going to be convicted by this, I know. You might feel like, oh, I'm just not doing enough. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, what, what I, I believe the Lord is wanting you and I to know, He says, come aside with me. Come, come aside with me. Why? Because He can produce more through your life than all the activity that you'll ever do. Because He can do, uh, in a moment, more through you. See, I, I love evangelism and, 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 and helping and watching evangelists go. But can I say to you, it, it's not enough. Evangelism is not going to reach the world the way we need it to. There's not enough time. There's not enough evangelists. Do you know what's going to reach it? Is when God comes down. When by revival He comes and He just touches an entire region. But He also needs those that are going to stand in the gap at that point too. Because they've been waiting in His presence. The anointing is what changes it. Not our activity. The anointing breaks the yoke. Not human fervor. He says, come aside with me. You know there's stuff He wants to teach you that you didn't even know how existed in that sense? Do you know there's stuff He wants to show you in His Word? But you won't slow down long enough to listen? Do you know there's keys that He can give that can open up situations that you didn't realize could just be opened up and things could just shift with one word? Because you're so busy, you're, and you think busyness is next to godliness, that's not true. So in the midst of Jesus' day, and it was a busy day, it was. Late into the night and deliverance, and my goodness, I'm just glad with one word he can see demons go. <laughs> I don't think he spent 15, 20 minutes dealing with every individual <laughs> and the healings. And, but then early in the morning, Personally, he wanted to get away from everyone else and get to a solitary place so he could wait on the Father. You think Jesus believed Isaiah 40? Because he did it. Morning, lunchtime, evening. Next morning, I mean, it says here, verse 36, and Simon and those who were with him searched for him. That means they couldn't find him very easily, could they? And when they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. 
And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. This is just the date in the life of Jesus. So you can almost see the pattern starting to repeat, can't you? He goes out then the next day and he's going into the next town. And he's preaching and seeing deliverance, healing, all that's going on. He preaches, teaches, and heals. You see this pattern happen again and again. By the way, Jesus is still the same today. His word is still living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. He reveals. He heals. He gives us ears to hear so that we can respond to him. Do you think it was costly to live that way? Life and ministry is not measured by its length, but by its intensity. Jesus' ministry was only three and a half years. Do you think he had it right? Do you think he was overcommitted maybe? Do you think he had his priorities in the wrong place? It's really quiet in here, isn't it? See, Jesus chose to serve. And it cost him dearly, and he gave everything. I think it's Mark, is it 10? I think it's 1045. I think it says it says that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a sacrifice. That's what he said. He chose to do it. Do you know why? Because there was no way you could get saved. There was no way you could save yourself. So he had to give his own life as a ransom for you. A sacrifice. That's the only way. He had to do all the work. So that when you came to the table with an empty hand, without anything to offer, he could... He could give you life. He could work in you. Now it's interesting because Jesus not only um, served and gave His life as a sacrifice. Those are things that you choose to do, by the way. Suffering is when other people do it to you. See, service is something you choose to do. You choose to give yourself to serve. Sacrifice is really a choice that you make to cross the line. It's going to cost you. Cost you more than maybe what you planned. Fair enough. Do it. Great. But suffering is when others make the choice as to what happens to you. Do you remember when Jesus was on the in the, the Garden of Gethsemane, and he begins to pray, and he prays, Father, not my will, but yours be done. If you read closely in Mark especially, up until that point, it says immediately he did. Immediately he did. Jesus is making the choices. After that, it says immediately they did. It shifted. It shifted from Serving and sacrifice to now suffering. Persecution, that's when they choose. And he gave himself to it. He gave himself up for it. He obeyed the Father. He was willing. And he offered his life on your behalf and mine as the ransom. And it was through the hands of wicked men. <laughs> That he was crucified. Yet the Father, it says, it pleased the Father to bruise him. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. See, there will be moments in your, your day to day where 
It's not your choice. I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go through this. I don't like going through it. I don't like what they're saying. But can I say to you that the same grace that was given to save you is the same grace that it's a gift to you to be able to suffer for His namesake. Philippians, just in case you don't, not sure, I tell you the truth, I guess. Philippians 1 and verses 27 to 30, and we'll finish up here. We'll come into land in just a minute here. Philippians 1, he says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so whether I come to you, come and see you or, an abs or am absent, I may hear of your affairs. That's verse 27. I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries which to them is proof of perdition, meaning that you're the one that's being saved, they're being destroyed, and that's what will happen. For, for to you of salvation, and that from God, for it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him, but also what? The same grace that it's given for you to be saved by Him is the same grace that's given so that you can endure when suffering comes. It's a gift. There are certain things you will not be able to enter into and identify in the Lord Jesus until you've gone through it. I remember one time I was in my office and there was all sorts of things happening. People were nah, 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 about this, nah, 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 about this, and I felt really alone. I had a friend of mine who at least was a friend, been in ministry with him for a bit. I remember he walked into my office and, and he, he just started having to go. You're this, you're not that, you should be this, you're not that. And, and I'm, just, I'm just sitting there and it's like I was getting hit from every side. And then that verse, I think it's Timothy where it says that no one stood with me but the Lord, He stood with me. And I tell you, it was as if Jesus was standing right there. It's only when you're in those kind of circumstances that you'll get the taste of things like that. The Apostle Paul said, I want a fellowship with His suffering." thinking, dude, are you out of your mind? He says, no, you have no idea. The fellowship that I have with the Lord Jesus and that identification with Him. There's something that goes so deep. It's like a shared experience. If you've ever been somewhere with someone else and they've done the same thing you have, and you're like, there's just this commonness that you got between you because they've been through the same kind of thing. And they can kind of look at you and go, yeah, I know what it's like. And you're like, yeah, I know what it's like. And everyone else, it's like an inside joke. Nobody else gets it. You can have that with Jesus. Or he looks at you and goes, you get this. And you're like, yeah, I get this. And there's an intimacy that you share with him that's different. Other people think you're odd. They think you're weird. They don't get it. They don't really care. <laughs> But when you walk in it, it's just, the Bible says it in Peter, there's joy inexpressible and full of glory. Still want to do the works of Jesus. See, Simon the sorcerer, he, he wanted to have the power without the relationship. In Acts, he was the one that says, can I give you some money so I can have this power too to lay hands on people and they can receive the Holy Spirit. He wanted the power without the relationship. 
Don't be like that. Because you know when all the busyness is done and you close your eyes for the last time, you know what's really going to count? It's the relationship. Remember what Jesus said to those? We did all this stuff in your name. And when he says, depart from me, I never knew you. It's relationship. The promise that we have is that if we believe and the Holy Spirit's filling you, you're going to do when you can. You can do the works of Jesus. And he says you can do greater. You can pray and ask anything in my name. and I'll do it. Being able to do his works. It's the day-to-day stuff. that produces the fruit and the life and the relationship. Walking with Him. Waiting on Him. Because He served, He suffered, and then He gave His life as a, as a ransom, didn't He? He's gone through it all. So if you walk with Him, I think He can get you through it too. Let's pray. Father, we just bow in Jesus' name. and We just thank You that Lord, You said that those who abide in You shall bear fruit, much fruit, more fruit. Lord Jesus, You're concerned about the relationship because You're able to do more in, in us and more through us in a moment than all of the fleshly activity of religion and effort and fleshly activity. Lord, You're, you're able to do more. And we need in our nation here, Lord, a move of Your Spirit, not just a move of of of, of giftings or a move of, Lord, um, um, Lord, enablings or callings. But we need Your presence. You to come down. Lord, we'll do what You've given us to do. And Lord, out of relationship that that fruit will be born. Lord, we ask You, please. We need You to do what we can't do. And in reviving power that You would come and touch the city. Touch Lan Romney, touch Romney, Trowbridge, St. Melons, Pentwain. Lord, that You would come. And You would work in power. We want to do Your works, Lord. We do but not at the expense of relationship. So help us to come aside. Come aside with You. Jesus. Where we hear those words, Beloved, come aside with me. Spend time with me. Give me Your heart. So Lord, help us, we pray. We just ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.